this morning, since it is our last time together, I really want to make the most out of it. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of times when I like to goof around and uh, spend some time uh, being a little bit silly in chapel. I really want to make the most of this last time together. So, I'm going to ask something huge of you guys. Huge. And that is that you guys would actually think and digest what we're going to talk about today. And, and that you'll allow me to talk to you as if you are intelligent, <laughs> caring people. And it's maybe scary that the you know, this idea of, of us thinking that way or acting that, that way this morning uh, might be a giant challenge because I know you guys have a ton of energy or some of you other guys are super tired or some of you are excited to go home or some of you are already sad about it. But we really want to make the most of this morning. If you have a Bible, could you turn it to Mark chapter 5? And we are going to be in Mark 5 almost this whole morning, and starting in verse 21, I'll give you a little bit of time to get there, and it's really appropriate that we sang that song this morning, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We're going to spend today talking about God's faithfulness to us. Uh, I just want to share with you guys uh, some of what God's Word has to say about who He is to us. And so I'm going to start reading in verse 21 of Mark chapter 5. It says this, uh, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Now, I want to stop there. Uh, when we read a Bible story, a lot of times it's easy for us to think of it as, you know, a coloring book that's all clean and perfect or Veggie Tale style, and that there's not a whole lot of uh, emotion or real life uh, danger going on. But I want you guys to know that there is a lot at stake in this in this passage and what what is going on. I would love for you guys to think about what it might be like to slide into Jairus's shoes and just look at the words that he uses or the words that are used in Scripture to talk about what's going on here. It says that he fell at Jesus' feet, that he was pleading, that he was pleading fervently, that he, he cried out that, that his daughter was dying. And desperately, he came to Jesus saying, please help me. This is a desperate man, um, and realized that the situation with his daughter is completely out of his control, that she is dying. There's no question about it. He doesn't come up and say, I think my daughter is sick and it might be serious. He says, she is dying. The one that I love is dying. And he knows that his daughter has no hope without Jesus. So he's crying out for help. It's urgent. It can't wait. And maybe you felt this way about a situation in your life, that it was urgent, that it was outside of your control, that you needed God to intervene. And we'll see what Jesus does. The story continues as Jairus asks Jesus to race back to his daughter before death takes her. Let's keep reading in verse 24. It says, Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus at once realized that the healing power had gone from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? Now, Remember this story, we're thinking about it from Jairus' perspective, the man whose daughter is dying. So he's racing home to hopefully get there in time to save his daughter before she dies. And here Jesus is stopping to ask questions of the crowd, and not just any questions. As the di disciples point out in the next verse, they actually seem to be pretty pointless. Here's what his disciples say in verse 31. His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. 
So poor Jairus is probably thinking the same thing. He's like, um, Jesus, you're in the middle of a crowd. Like 97 people are pressing up next to you. Uh, why are you asking who touched me? Oh, and by the way, aren't we running home to save my daughter who desperately needs you, who is dying? You can tell that uh, it seems like if we were in that situation, we would be distraught, that we'd be desperate and worried and wondering if Jesus even cared about us because he's taking the time to stop and, and get involved and ask these questions that the Jairus didn't understand, that it seemed like he was delaying. But the story goes on. Verse 33. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. Ouch. This woman over here is rejoicing. Her life had been completely changed. She had been given a healing that she thought was probably not possible after striving for it for her whole life. And with one touch from Jesus, she's healed. And she's rejoicing and she's been restored and her suffering is over. And then just a few feet away, there's Jairus, who's soul crushed. While this woman is ecstatic, he is in despair. This would be maybe something similar to if you were in the hospital and you had been suffering with a disease, uh, cancer or something like that. And you're sharing a room with someone else and the doctor comes in and tells the person next to you who's had the same treatment as you, Hey! everything worked. You're going to have a perfect recovery. And then they turn over and come to you and they say, uh, we did all the same things we did for him, for you, but since we did him first, you ran out of time and it was too far. So you're going to die. You've got two weeks to live. Like, can you imagine the contrast between um, the situations that Jesus turned and helped one person before helping the other to the expense of Jairus, his daughter, and his family? Jairus must have felt that Jesus had let him down, that he took his time, that he took too much time. He must have thought that he let his daughter die because Jesus was dilly-dallying and asking questions to a crowd, and now his daughter was gone forever. But the story still continues. In verse 36, But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just have faith. And I cannot imagine hearing this in that kind of situation. You know, your daughter is dead. One of the people you care about most in the entire world is gone. I could have done something about it, but I didn't. But don't be afraid, have faith. Here we can see super clearly that sometimes following Jesus is incredibly difficult. That sometimes trusting Jesus is immensely, immensely hard. Sometimes it seems like it's beyond what we can actually do. But we can know that even when it's difficult and we don't understand that our God does have a plan. Let's keep reading. Verse 37. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. And the crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave and took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened and then told them to give her something to eat. Jesus did something that was impossible. He raised the dead. All of Jairus' fear and concern was wiped away, and Jesus showed his power by giving life to a dead person. And he showed his love by giving Jairus his daughter back. Jesus was in control the whole time. 
And like he said, all Jairus had to do was not fear and have faith. Basically, Jesus was calling him and simply saying, trust me. Because I'm trustworthy. Trust me. This is the same call that we have. Our God calls us to trust him all the time. He calls out for us and, and asks that we in our life, in the different situations that we go through, the struggles that we have, and the difficulties uh, that we have to weather. Our God calls out for us to trust him. And we know that he's God, the creator, our savior, the one who, Colossians 1 says, holds everything together. And he says, this great God says, I love you, so trust me. But it can be difficult sometimes. And so often we don't understand what God is doing in our lives. We don't get it. We don't understand our struggles. And trusting God and having faith does not remove that lack of understanding. When we choose to trust God, it doesn't mean that everything all of a sudden, all of a sudden becomes easy. It means that we have somewhere to turn when things are difficult. We say that by faith we're trusting God to take care of us even when we don't understand. Listen to the first few verses of Romans chapter 5. It says this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And in this passage, and in our lives, faith is the key. That we are made right with God and saved because of the faith that we can have in him. Because when we trust in him and we choose to turn to him and we choose to believe that he will take care of his people, when you choose to have faith, God will not let you down. And Christ brings us into a place of undeserved privilege and into his own glory. Isn't that incredible that God would do that for us? And he does it because of faith. And we have a hope for salvation through all of the tough times in life because of faith. And we know that God will not let us down because he confirms this promise by giving us an incredible gift. And that's the Holy Spirit who fills our hearts with his love. We're called to have faith and to trust him through all the difficult, worrying, confusing, and painful things in life because we know that he will never let us down. He is always faithful. He is always strong. And his love always endures. One of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is in Genesis chapter 15. And I'm not going to read it now because it's long and complicated. And really we could have spent this entire week and more discussing this one chapter. But Genesis 15 is so encouraging because it is a place where God makes an incredible promise to his servant Abraham. And the setup is like this. Uh, Abraham is really old. And God in this chapter confirms to Abraham that even though he's old, God will give him a son. And he goes on to tell him that his children will outnumber the stars. And Abraham believes. He has faith. And that faith is counted as righteousness. And that's, that's where the story could end, really. That Abraham believes and, and God will do great things and is counted as righteousness. But... God went even further than that. He did this crazy thing. He had Abraham cut up a bunch of animals, cut them in half, and lay them on the ground. And then Abraham went to sleep, and God appeared to Abraham in a vision. And the Spirit of God came down and passed between these chopped up animals. And if you guys are like me and you're hearing this, you're like, ew, that's weird. And that's kind of disgusting and gross. And to be honest with you, I don't get it. But... What happened here was God 
in essence, was signing a contract, signing a contract with his servant Abraham. And the way contracts were signed back then is you cut up some animals, and when you said something to someone and you promised to do something, you'd walk between the animals. And what you were saying when you did that is you were saying, if I break my promise, if I don't do what I've promised to do, you have the right to chop me up like you chopped up these animals. That's a pretty strong promise, right? Like, how many of you guys have promised things and you're like, well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. If that was on the line, if you were like, hey, if I go back on my word on this one, you can kill me. That's kind of like this whole cross my heart thing to another level, okay? A whole nother level. So this is what God does. He signs this contract with Abraham and he puts himself on the line. He says, if I don't come for, through for you on my promise, it's all over. That's a serious contract. If I don't keep my word, I'm a dead man. And if I go back on my promise to you, I should be slaughtered. My blood will pay, will pay the price if I break this promise. And God did come through. And God did give Abraham a son. And he did make his son into a people. And out of those people, he gave a savior to the world. And that's Jesus and one of the most astounding things about Jesus is that what he did for us is so undeserved, like we read in Romans chapter 5. Because we broke a contract with him, and ultimately it was our lives who were forfeit. But he was the one who paid the price for us. We were the ones who failed God. We were the ones who chose sin over him. And we were the ones who needed to pay with our lives because the result, the wages, and the consequences of sin is death. And in our sinfulness, all of mankind, you and me, failed to keep its contract to live for and to love God. But instead of killing us and instead of, you know, wiping us out and calling for our blood, Jesus gave his own blood for us. That God dropped his wrath down on Jesus. That he was the one who was broken. That he was the one who bled. And ultimately, he was the one who paid the price for us. We broke the contract, but his body was broken for us to pay our debt. And that is awesome love, undeserved kindness, and unending commitment. If your God would do that for you, why do we fail to trust that he will take care of us day in and day out? Why do, you, why do we feel like he'll give up on us now? Why do we feel like he's uninterested in us now? Why do we choose not to have, faithful, have faith in him now? He has proven his faithfulness to us. And we need to trust him. And the way that we do this is by living for him, living his way all the time and no matter what, because we have faith and not fear. And I'm just going to end with this from Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 14. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So here it is. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you, and you are a child of God. You are not a fearful slave. And you can call the God of your universe your father, and he calls you his son or his daughter. And he loves you without limit. And he proved that by giving his own life on the cross for your salvation. And now he has given you his spirit. He is faithful. So have faith in all of your thoughts, your actions, your attitudes, and the decisions that you choose to make. Understand that God is faithful and don't give up on following him. Don't be afraid. Have faith. He is working in you. And he will work through you. 
and he will do more in your life than you can believe, imagine, or comprehend. Because we have a great God, and we are his workmanship. And God doesn't do a poor job on the things he works on. So if God is working on you, if God is working in you, and if God is working through you, expect that he will come through, that it will be amazing, and understand that you can trust him no matter what. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much that even when we don't understand, we know that you have a plan. And even when we are weak, we know that you are strong. So we ask that you would help us to remember your faithfulness, your great love, and what you did for us on the cross, and the spirit that you've given to, to us now. God, we thank you that you've counted us as your sons and your daughters. Please give us the faith to live like your sons and daughters, to follow you, to belong to you, and in every situation, to trust you because you are good and that there is nothing out of your control. We do love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.